Welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event as this afternoon, April 25th, 2022, we're having a Courthouse Steps oral argument webinar on a case argued this morning called Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. I'm Nicholas Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on our call today are those of our expert. We're very glad to be joined this afternoon by Stephanie Taub, She's senior counsel at First Liberty Institute. A quick note, First Liberty and Kirkland and Ellis represented uh, Coach Kennedy in this case and in these arguments. This morning, the case was argued uh, by Paul Clement at the Supreme Court for, for Kennedy, and we'll get more details on who argued what and uh, a review of the case, a review of the arguments and where uh, the case might go from Stephanie. So Stephanie, thanks very much for being with us. The floor is yours. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Nick. And thank you to everyone who is listening in today. We're going to talk about the oral argument that happened this morning, just a few hours ago before the Supreme Court. And as Nick mentioned, the case was Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. So in a very short summary of the case for anyone that um, hasn't been following it, we have a high school football coach who lost his job after taking a knee for brief quiet prayer after football games. So brief history, in 2008, before his very first game at Bremerton High School in Washington, he made a commitment to God to give a prayer of thanksgiving after every game, and he did so for around seven years. He started praying alone at first, and then over the years, students act, asked to join him, and he told them that it was a free country. In 2015, the school district told him to stop involving students, and he complied but the school district fired him anyway, explaining that they were uh, removing him from his job because they were concerned about establishment clause liability, specifically concerns that allowing the coach's fleeting religious expression would be seen as official endorsement of religion. And they specifically banned him because this was religious activity. So he brought a religious discrimination lawsuit under the free speech and free exercise clauses of the US constitution. So this case has the potential to impact teachers and coaches First Amendment rights across the country, and it really could help clarify the law res with respect to the Establishment Clause, which, as I'm sure most of you know, is uh, in need of clarification. So my firm is the First Liberty Institute, and we, along with Kirkland and Ellis, represent Joe, Coach Joe Kennedy. Paul Clement, uh, former Solicitor General of the United States, argued on behalf of the coach this morning. And Americans United for Separation of Church and State represent the school district. Uh, Richard Katsky argued for the respondent in the school district. All right, so let's jump right into the argument analysis. So big picture, uh, this today's argument was very philosophical. The questions were trying to get at the heart of the First Amendment issues here and address the potential tensions that we see sometimes between uh, the free exercise clause, the free speech, and the establishment clause. So I wanted to touch on the main key issues that keep coming up. All right, and so the first one is the free speech argument. So the main threshold issue here is whether this is government speech or private speech. So should when Coach Kennedy immediately after football games goes and takes a knee, um, in a quiet prayer, is that should that be considered the government speaking or should that be considered his own private speech? Uh, so the argument from the school district has been that the coach still has responsibilities after the game. He still has general uh, or he still is on duty, he has the responsibility to make sure that the team players get um, to the, their next location appropriately. And so uh, the school district's lawyer said you have to look at the time, place, manner uh, of the speech and look at whether the objective observer would think that the speech is government speech or private speech. And the main argument from the um, from Coach Kennedy from our side is that that not everything you do during the school day should be considered government speech. And um, Paul Clement pointed to Garcetti's overly broad or caution against overly broad job descriptions. So if the government is allowed to make a job, make its employees job descriptions so broad that it encompasses everything you do every second from the moment you arrive to the moment you uh, leave work, then that could be, uh, that we could be too far and infringe on the First Amendment rights of um, teachers, coaches, and other 
government employees. Um, after all, Tinker has been clear that teachers and as well as students don't lose their First Amendment rights when they step through the schoolhouse gates. So some of the questions that were notable from the argument uh, this morning um, get at, well, is that Thomas asked, or I guess he phrased it in a statement, we know that this isn't part of his job because the school didn't know uh, about uh, about Coach Kennedy's religious expression for years. And then when they did find out, they told him not to do this. So that, that gets at the question of how can this be government speech if the school clearly does not endorse it, clearly does not want to send this message, has been very public about not wanting to send this message. So it's odd to think that Coach Kennedy is sending a government message um, when he is kneeling in private prayer. And then some of the questions from Kavanaugh and Barrett uh, pose a, an interesting hypothetical to test the limits of, of the school district's argument is if you made the sign of the cross, for example, right before games. It would be, see, it would be strange to see that as government speech rather than, rather than private speech, um, because you have a fleeting action that's clearly uh, it's clearly religious and personal in nature, and it'd be really it'd be really odd for an observer to think that what they're doing is somehow speaking on behalf of the school district. So that's the the first main tension here uh, in this case is whether this is going to be considered a gov government speech or private speech. If it is government speech, then the school has much more leeway to exercise control and censorship. But if it's private speech, that gets into the next set of questions, which is. If it's private speech, so let's say Coach Kennedy, when he kneels at the 50 yard line after games, is speaking on his own behalf and he's just saying a 15 to 30 second um, prayer. You can see that he's religious. He's just speaking on his behalf. Okay, then what? How, how, do, how should courts analyze this? Should they apply the Pickering balancing test like it does for political speech? Or should it apply strict scrutiny because this is religious discrimination and discrimination against religious speech, so similar to the kinds that you see against um, against students that the court has been um, has been clear is uh, religious discrimination in Rosenberger, Good News Club, things like that, uh, cases cases like that. Uh, Barrett asked the question. Justice Barrett asked the question: Have we ever applied Pickering to a straight up free exercise claim when we're talking about? Um, religious discrimination. And um, the school district's uh, attorney, Katsky, um, said no, that this court hasn't done that. Um, he argued that the court has applied Pickering to a petition clause, uh, petition clause claim, but it hasn't done so in the free exercise context. So there's a really fundamental question of, is that if this is private speech, what, uh, which test should apply? Um, and the school district's argument was he didn't think that political speech should be given more protection than religious speech. That was one point that he made a few times. Um, and on the other side, Coach Kennedy points out, well, strict scrutiny is a better fit because it's it provides this framework to evaluate the specific sincerely held religious belief of the employee and then to look at that in um, in the context of whether the school has a compelling interest. And so if you're talking, if you're concerned about workability, um, if you hear <laughs> Paul Clement said, don't please don't replace the um, establishment clause or endorsement jurisprudence with pickering balancing, because then you're going to, you're just going to encounter a lot of the same workability, uh, lack of predictability concerns that you have um, when you're talking about um, uh, well, well that, that are currently coming up in one of the frequent criticisms of establishment clause uh, case law in this area. And so Justice Barrett um, um, also asked uh, a very interesting question. If we think this is private speech, is there an establishment clause issue? Because there, what's the state action? If, if the employee is speaking on his own behalf and not on behalf of the school, can it be an establishment clause question? was the state action, which is a very interesting way of thinking about it. And that leads us to the next, the, the second main fundamental bucket of um, issues that we were talking about. So the first one was, what do you do with, how do you look at the free speech 
question that's going on here. Is it public or government, or is it private versus government speech? And then if it's private speech, which test applies? And then um, the other set of questions and probably the most interesting takeaway from or the oral argument this morning, which if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, is just fascinating for the establishment clause issues that came up. Um, some of the justices want to clarify what the establishment clause is really getting at and which test to use. So some of the justices, notably Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, uh, were, were, or Kavanaugh made the point that the Supreme Court hasn't used the Lemon endorsement test in two decades, that um, the lower courts are still applying Lemon, are still applying endorsement tests, particularly in school context. But um, SCOTUS's cases have been, have been much more focused in on the history and tradition of the Establishment Clause. You can look at Van Orden, you can look at Town of Greece, you can look at American Legion. And, and Kavanaugh said this. So, and then Gorsuch took that and, and said, okay, one of the difficulties is in this case is this, this, the rationale that the school district gave for its discipline of Coach Kennedy was its fear of endorsement concerns. They didn't list any other, um, uh, they, they didn't list any anything else really. The main concern was the endorsement concerns. They listed it eight times in their letters that were explaining the reason why they were uh, suspending Coach Kennedy uh, and not not going not planning on rehiring him. So what do we? Gorsuch asked, "What do we do if we think that the the school district applied the wrong test? They fired him for endorsement concerns, but what if? Um, but endorsement hasn't been the test for decades. They really should have been looking at." Um, the court's most recent, most recent uh, jurisprudence, which is uh, much more in line of American Legion, not in line of um, endorsement. And even Breyer pointed or explained that uh, Lemon has, or acknowledged that Lemon has imperfections. But Breyer, on the other hand, uh, Justice Breyer was explaining that the establishment clause or his view of the establishment clause is that it's there to prevent the country from becoming more divisive on the basis of religion. And he worries about the workability or how many, he specifically asked how many cases would it be calling into question if you um, jettisoned lemon, if you jettisoned the lemon test. So so these, these back and forths really get it. it. It's possible we could see something in the opinion that clarifies that the endorsement test is not good law. It's not the framework that schools should be using to decide cases like this. Um, that if you're looking, if you're looking at a case like this, or uh, if they, they could say that endorsement is not appropriate, or they could say that lemon in this context is is not appropriate. Um, but that would be a, a game changer if the court could clarify uh, some of these some of these issues. And then the other uh, the other main establishment clause concern was raised by um, Sotomayor and Justice Kagan when they're talking, specifically when Kagan was talking about, she asked specifically what Paul Clement, what the point of the establishment clause is. If you look at the school district, the school prayer cases, um, what what is it getting at? And it's getting, in, in her perspective, it was getting at this issue of student coercion um, she made the point, okay, you're not contesting the right. Um, so Coach Kennedy is not contesting the right of a school district to discipline Coach Kennedy if it prayed during the official post-game talk, of which he's not. He's not, he, he has uh, agreed with the school district to keep religion out of his post-game talk. I mean, he's still just looking for to, to kneel for a brief 15 to 30 second prayer on the, on the field. Um, but if you look, and so Justice Kagan responded, um, so why, why is that not okay? But what you're asking for is okay. Um, in her perspective, if you look at the prayer cases, the idea of when a school can discipline him, it emphasizes uh, coercion and whether there is undue pressure to participate in religious activities. And, and Paul Clement over the course of the, over the course of the argument had a few different responses to that. So, 
the first response is, well, this really isn't about, if you look at the record of this case, the record's clear that it's not about coercion, um, that this school was concerned about uh, endorsement. They said the word endorsement over and over and over again. Um, they acknowledge in their letter that there has been no, that there has been no coercion, um, that all of the student activity has been voluntary, that this, um, that the coach's activity was fleeting um, and that he never, he never coerced anyone. Um, so that if you look at the contemporaneous evidence at the time. Uh, so that would be the, the first response. And then the other one is um, there's a difference between direct coercion, which everyone agrees is, um, is wrong and violates the rights of, um, of students. Um, but and there's a difference between that and and what you could what could be called um, implicit peer pressure, which what um, that's the term that Kavanaugh used. Um, so the really interesting point is that this isn't an issue that's so so it's certainly possible that students could be uh, could feel pressure to agree with their teachers or their coaches on a variety of issues, and it's not specific to religion. And so that was a, a, an interesting point. And so maybe there are uh, certain responses to that. You can work, um, um, schools should work really hard to eliminate coercion. Um, but if you want to go so far as to eliminate even the specter of, um, of this sort of implicit peer pressure, you might have to go so far as to overrule tinker, get rid of um, teacher expression altogether, because anything that's sufficiently expressive, uh, any sort of teacher speech could could input um, could have that sort of effect. So really, why are you treating religion differently from a variety of different other sorts of concerns? And so that's. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's really an interesting tension, and we'll see how the court uh, the court uh, responds to that. And Kavanaugh, oh, so he at so he was taking a look at the establishment clause school prayer cases, and for just um, and he pointed out to Engel, Lee, V. Weisman, and Santa Fe, and he was saying that there are different kinds. There are the kinds where you are compelled to say the prayer or compelled to be present which is Engel, Lee, Santa Fe, and that Santa Fe is really one of the more, uh, one of the more directly analog analogous because it has to do with football or at least seems on point on its face. Um, Paul Clement's response was that uh, Santa Fe can be distinguished in a variety of ways. A lot of the case turned on the school's official uh, sponsorship of a election where the school put forth an election for all of the students to pick a designated representative that could have the opportunity to give a prayer, um, which is a lot more government involvement than you have here. And then it also has the prayers given out over the loudspeaker, which is certainly not what's going on, what's going on here. So for a taking a step back and a prediction for what the uh, what the opinion might say, uh, it's it's not dispositive, of, of course, for, but a helpful starting point to look at how the case might break down is to look at the last time this case came before the Supreme Court. So the last time uh, the case went all the way up in uh, 2019 and on a preliminary injunction stage. And the court denied cert at the time in order to allow for more development of the factual record. Um, and in there, four justices, joined a opinion dissenting from the denial of, uh, of cert. So that was Alito, Kavanaugh, Thomas, and Gorsuch. So that's not dispositive, of course, of how they'll rule in this case, but it does show that at least a few years ago, they had serious concerns about the Ninth Circuit's reasoning below. They called the reasoning troubling and were very concerned about a limit, uh, creating a broad rule or rubber stamp or um, condoning a broad rule that would allow schools to consider virtually everything a teacher does to be school speech and therefore subject to school censorship. So because of that, we have those four. And then a lot of eyes are going to be on Justice Barrett and Chief Justice Roberts to see how they're 
uh, how they're going to going to vote in this case. So it's hard to read into Justice Roberts based on his um, he only uh, his questioning here a little more. Uh, but Justice Barrett seemed very engaged and asked some pointed questions of the other side. Uh, so we're optimistic that this case could uh, be a, a win for teacher rights for. Um, the freedom of expression that school that teachers do not abandon their First Amendment rights when they when they sign up to be uh, to be public school teachers and coaches. So very exciting moment. Will the court finally uh, put uh, an end to Lemon or another state or just another stake in Lemon? Uh, will the court finally put an end to the endorsement test? Could the court clarify? that just like Rosenberger and Good News Club line of cases, schools do not discriminate against private teacher speech on the basis of religion. And uh, will the court clarify Tinker's promise that teachers don't, as well as students, don't lose their First Amendment rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates. And so I welcome all of your questions. Great, thanks, Stephanie. That was a, a great overview. Um, so we're looking to you, the audience, for questions now, uh, please submit them via chat or Q&A chat. Um, we'll take them as they come in. Uh, but my first question, Stephanie, I, I like to ask it when we are on the heels of any oral argument. Anything particularly surprising to you? Anything unexpected? Uh, anything like that stand out to you? Well, the focus, honestly, the focus on um, Lemon was interesting because we're the court doesn't, Breyer made the point that the court doesn't necessarily have to have to go there, but some of the justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, seemed very intent on clarifying the law in that, in that, in that area. And because this case did turn on the, the school district stated rationale, which was based in the, in the endorsement rationale, it, it could provide a perfect, a perfect um, opportunity for the court to say, well, the school district was saying that we're afraid that a reasonable observer would see this as endorsement. And the court says schools don't have to worry about that anymore because X, Y, Z is now the proper test. That could, um, an opinion could say something like that. So that's that's exciting line of questioning. So if the court were to go that way, um, what should replace the endorsement test? Yeah, so, that's a great question. I mean, we talked about coercion, actual coercion as, um, um, but that really is uh, derived from the um, American Legion, uh, town of Greece history and tradition. So if you look at, um, so you have to look at how the establishment, what the purpose of the establishment clause was, how it was applied at the founding and the maybe six buckets of, of um, of concerns that the founders had at the beginning for um, what makes uh, what makes something an establishment of religion. What was the kind of activities that they were concerned about that would create an establishment of religion? So that was the, that's the kind of the kind of questions that the court really should be asking. Very interesting. Oh. Just curious, we don't have any audience questions yet. Just a reminder, please submit them uh, via the chat and uh, we'll take them as we can. Um, oh, and actually, let's see. One just popped up. Uh, well, you kind of addressed this at the end, but what is the future of lemon, the lemon test? Do we think the court might finally do away with it? Maybe a quick primer uh, for people who, who don't know about it. The lemon test, what is it? What are the prongs? And, and then what's the future of it? Yeah, so the lemon test is a test that's been around for decades, um, that it was trying to come up with a, it was a very ambitious project to try to describe um, what constitutes an establishment clause violation. And so one of the prongs of the lemon test, so you look at the uh, purpose of the activity, you look at whether it's endorsing um, religion and whether the principal effect is going to be um, supporting or against religion. And so that's, that's lemon in a nutshell. And it's been very unworkable. And I, <laughs> the majority of the court uh, at various points in time has had a lot of criticisms about it, how it's trying trying to be kind of was pulled out of thin air and is trying to be a um, 
guidelines for courts, but it really just turns into a, a framework that is stacked against it's stacked against religion because primarily because of the endorsement test. And then it's also very malleable that leads to really inconsistent arguments in the different cases. And then the endorsement test is kind of like lemon light. So it is um, just one prong of lemon, but sometimes is used as dispositive. So they don't look at anything else. You just look at whether a reasonable observer would see this as a government endorsing or favoring one religion or non-religion or one particular religion over others. And if that's the case, then game over and it's an establishment clause violation. Um, and so that can lead that can lead school districts across the country to have a very um, hostile position toward religion. They can see their, their uh, school district lawyers often when we encounter them, they can see their role as to scrub the campus of anything that even partakes of the religious um, on, um, yeah, on campus. And that can lead to infringing on the personal um, independent rights of teachers or students. You see that you see that sometimes is if you have this overzealous um, interpretation of the establishment clause, which has been fed by these older endorsement cases, it can lead to schools just overcorrecting and going um, and infringing on the private First Amendment rights of teachers and students. I'd point you to the, the Notre Dame brief, amicus brief supporting Coach Kennedy, which talks about the endorsement test and some of the problems that it had, um, that it's had in, um, in administrability and how different some um, schools across the country that encountered the same question can come out on very different sides of, um, of any particular issue. Uh, that's, a, that's a great amicus brief to look at. Yeah, good point. Um, staying on the, the matter of tests for a second, um, is, is the coercion test in this context um, simply based on the age of students, the young age, I suppose, uh, without that presumption, what's the ground of coercion? How could one gauge if or when a child is coerced? Yeah, so there are, um, I mean, that's, that's a good question. The so Supreme Court, some of the Supreme Court's cases have, have held that those coercion concerns are more um, are stronger when you're talking about younger children than when you're talking about college age or um, high school age children, the concerns might not be as strong. That didn't really play a lot in the oral arguments today. They didn't talk much about the age of the children. Um, I think, but everyone did agree that if, um, if there was evidence of of uh, direct coercion or um, of being forced to participate in, in religious activity, then that would um, not, uh, that would clearly be shameful and not allowed. Um, this question is about the facts of the case. Several of the justices raised questions regarding whether the facts are sufficiently clear. For example, Justice Breyer asked Paul Clement to respond to many, the questioner says six, statements of fact. How likely is it that a majority of the court might dismiss the case as improvidently granted or remanded for clarification of the facts? Right, um, so that's a good question. He did, um, He uh, Justice Breyer did raise those, um, made a point that there were fact, um, facts in dispute. But I mean, if you look at the, so if, I mean, it's true, if you look at, if you read both, both sides briefs, which it's true, of, probably virtually every case, there's very different stories being told. But um, but if you look at the actual facts of what happened on any particular game, there's, uh, there's a substantial agreement on everything that's that's main. And so the, the real reason why there's this difference in the stories is because it's what are we deciding to focus on? Because so some of the, for instance, some of the school district's focus has been on um, Coach Kennedy's pri uh, previous practice before uh, before the school told him, told him to not involve students and um but as uh if but um paul clement said you have to look at the reason the school gave at the time for why they disciplined coach kennedy and they pointed to two particular games and on both of those games he was not playing with the bremerton students um, um and and there's and that's not really in dispute though so, so uh the fact so the facts factual issues once you break them down are are not are not as much in dispute as you might think from just a quick reading of the of the brief. 
Makes sense. Uh, well, staying on this question of remanding for a second, the uh, questioner asks that Clement seemed very forceful in urging the justices not to remand back to the Ninth Circuit. Do we really think uh, that you might have a majority uh, that would remand the case? And if so, what reason would they would they give? I'm not sure. Uh, it's interesting to note that um, the case was put up to en banc um, a vote, uh, the Ninth Circuit before, and it just barely didn't have enough um, votes for en banc review. And there were quite a few good um, uh, opinions, um, like a, a Judge Scanlon's opinion, descending from the denial um, of en banc review. That's really that's really worth looking at. Um, how likely is it that the case will be remanded back to the Ninth Circuit? I mean, it, it's hard to tell uh, if if the court really takes digs into the record and looks at the uh, the reasons that were given at the time, which is pretty clear, is concerned about endorsement. It said it wasn't concerned. It, it said there was no coercion. It said the activity was voluntary. There's emails from the um, school district officials that say that um, uh, that the issue is not about praying with the players anymore. It's about a coach's personal right to pray. Uh, so it's... Um, hoping that the, the Supreme Court, I mean, the Supreme Court has enough, they can, they can rule on this, they can set a clear rule. And we'll just have to, we'll just have to see what happens. Um, and just thinking out loud here, would the rule in this case be based on the, um, the establishment clause concerns of the school or the let's say the free exercise rights of the coach or yeah. could it be either or both? Yeah. So that, so the coach has brought a free speech claim and a, um, and, uh, and a free exercise claim. So the free speech claim, you have to look at whether it's government speech or private speech. And I think it's pretty clear that it is um, it's private speech. And then you have to look at whether um, which case law applies, whether you apply strict scrutiny or um, or the Pickering balancing test. And so if you apply strict scrutiny, you can um, you can rule in favor of the coach and you don't even have to address the question of, uh, you don't even have to address the question of the establishment clause um, and what test could apply. But if you wanna um, have a home run here and say that lemon is dead <laughs> um, and or, or at least the, the endorsement test is um, no longer good law, uh, that would be um, that would be fantastic. It would just clarify that the, the only or the only or main reason that the school district gave is not um, not still good law. And so school districts should not stop relying on the endorsement test. Okay. Um, this has come up in a couple of our questions. I'm going to try to kind of pull them together. But let's say the court does rule against the coach, and um, let's say it goes the free speech route, um, considers the speech, uh, let's say government speech, right? It's, it's limited by his role or his office. Um, how might that kind of ruling affect teachers' abilities in other contexts? I'm a couple of the examples that have come up without getting into the weeds of them are like uh, fights over the curriculum or whether students should be wearing masks or things like that. How, how might that kind of ruling, if at all, affect those other areas? Yeah, so if they, I mean, we could see a real crackdown on teacher expression and the concern there would be whether it's going to be applied equally um, across the board, because I could easily see uh, school districts saying, oh, we're not allowing teacher expression on paper. And then if you look in practice and, oh, there are only certain kinds of expression that have been, is, are still being discriminated against. So that's really something to, um, uh, to look out for. Um, and then a lot, uh, one question that didn't, that didn't come up in my talk that, I, um, that I'm reminded of is a lot of the concerns that the school districts might have could be addressed by imposing a neutral rule. Um, so um, Paul Clement mentioned multiple times that this is an option for, for schools. So if they are concerned that something might be disruptive, for example, or, or um, that um, 
they, they can't address some of these concerns by putting in place a rule that's neutral toward religion that just says, okay, these, um, these certain times are, um, are when you're, you're clearly on duty and you need to be actively um, engaging in these certain activities. And this is not a, not a time for, um, for private activities um, or like a neutral rule. When you're talking about um, one of the questions that Justice Barrett had was an af after school clubs that took place off campus that seemed to be private. And if there was some reason for um, concern about limiting those kinds of clubs, um, a school could put in place um, teachers cannot sponsor after school clubs at their homes or something like that. That would be a, an example of a religion neutral rule that would probably be permissible. But you have to look at the at the particulars of the, cir the circumstances. Uh, interesting. Uh, searching for the neutral principles, I suppose. Um, oh, this is good. We have a question trying to get in the weeds of how the justices might apply these kinds of tests. Um, uh, can you speak to the, well, the potentially disruptive effect of the prayer when there's, quote, from the questioner, so much public attention, cameras, local politicians, etc. How, if in any way, does that set up, maybe you, you might say it's not disruptive or let's take the premise that it is disruptive. How does that kind of consideration weigh into an application of any kind of uh, endorsement test or coercion test or the prongs of the limit test? Yeah, um, so that is an interesting question. So um, as, as we said before, the school didn't rely on that, that they were saying that their explanations was not because of a, of a um, of disruption, but because of endorsement concerns. And then also um, there was one game that the school district complains about or uh, their attorneys now complain about as being disruptive. But if you look at the, the, the two games that followed it, there wasn't, there wasn't disruption. There wasn't any sort of, um, um, there's, there's not even alleged to be um, disruption. So this is the sort of thing that, um, that could that could blow over, but we'll see if. Um, oh, I guess we'll we'll see what what they have to say uh, about this particular question. I think you really have to go back to what the what the school said contemporaneously at the time that they said that that's not what this case is about. This case is about um, is about whether in, about endorsement and specifically because he could be seen doing something that is religious. The school thought that they had that they had the obligation to censor him. Well, one of our questioners going right off this as, and this might get right to the heart of things, can the court decide the case on coercion grounds if it sees that in the facts, even if the parties see only endorsement? I mean, a decision like that could go either way, but uh, what, what's the, I guess the question really is about the relationship between the facts, what the parties are arguing, and then what the justices can do. Yeah, I mean, that kind of would be a, um, I mean, the court, the court kind of has the ability to do quite a lot of things <laughs> with the, um, so I wouldn't say that the court can't do something like that. Um, um, so could they decide it on, on those grounds? Um, they could, they could say this is what the, the proper, the proper test is, and this is how it should be applied in this, in this circumstance, um, whether you're talking about coercion or whether you're talking about American Legion. Um, and just go ahead and apply the facts to the law in that case. Um, and one another interesting point is that this is um, it is summary judgment. Our cross motions for summary judgment, summary judgment was granted against Coach Kennedy. So if you're looking, if so, to the extent there is a dispute on the facts, they have to be viewed in the light most favorable to Coach Kennedy. Great. Um, we got another question. Uh, this. Questioner says this might touch on some questions asked already, but we'll go to it anyways. How far could we see required non-endorsement go in schools if Kennedy speech is considered endorse endorsement, or I suppose it's considered that the school endorses his speech by allowing him to pray in this manner? The example that comes to mind is um, is a kind of extension of Justice Barrett's point. Would simply wearing a crucifix and necklace could that be considered endorsed by the school if a teacher is just wearing that? It's it's not an unheard of argument. I mean, the state, if you look at the state of Oregon, they had bans on um, teachers wearing religious garb, specifically um, 
uh, a teacher brought a case before the Oregon Supreme Court who was wearing a turban. And um, that rule was not um, changed until maybe a decade ago, 2010, which is really, really recent to have. Um, so, so these sorts of um, this argument that allowing teachers to do anything or wear anything that shows that they are religious could have some sort of a coercive pressure, an indirect coercive pressure, very slight, um, and therefore we're going to censor it. Uh, we've seen it before. It could certainly happen again. Uh, one of my main worries is, is it going to be applied consistently or is it just going to be applied against uh, the disfavored groups, whatever, whatever part of the country you're looking at, you might see um, and disfavoring different different groups, but either way, you, you I mean you don't want you obviously you don't want that to happen. So we're kind of in this world right now, in that schools right now are very afraid of being sued by um, groups like Americans United for Separation of Church and State, and they're they're not as afraid of um, being sued for violating religious rights of students and teachers. And so the Supreme Court has over and over and over and over again said that when you're opening up a, a forum, for example, um, when you're talking about student speech, you can't just single out religion and say, you can't come at it from a religious, pers uh, a religious viewpoint. So the real hope here is that when we're talking about teachers and teachers' private speech and something that is clearly private when you're just uh, kneeling for 30 seconds um, in prayer, that that, that teachers are entitled to uh, to uh, have that uh, re religious viewpoint and not be singled out for um, disciplinary treatment solely because this is a religious activity. And so we've seen it over and over and over again in the student context, and now we hope that they can apply it in the teacher context. Great. Um, I think we've gotten to, to most of these questions here. Any thoughts you have as we uh, for to wrap up here, anything you didn't get to, um, any parts of the case you didn't cover? What do you, what, I mean, this is the obvious one. What, what do you think the decision will be? Well, I think, I mean, I, I think it'll be a decision in, in favor of Coach Kennedy. I think it'll be a, a decision that clarifies that this is uh, private speech and that just like student speech, they can't discriminate against private speech. Um, that private religious speech of teachers. And um, I hope that along the way they can pepper in some clarification about the Establishment Clause law, but that would be a cherry on top. So that's my prediction. Great, well, um, on behalf of the Federalist Society, Stephanie, I wanna thank you very much for the benefit of your valuable time and expertise um, speaking to our audience about this case. Thank you to our audience for calling in your great, great questions. Um, as always, keep an eye on your email and our website for announcements about upcoming events like this one, especially as the Supreme Court term uh, winds down. We'll be covering most of these big decisions um, in, the, in the coming months. So keep an eye out for that. Until next time, we are adjourned.